Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, firstly, let me say I'm sorry to be inflicting a, a video on you. Um, I'm not all that happy about it either. I go a bit better with a live audience. Um, most of you know that old CEOs and current CEOs, there's a little actor in all of us, but I think we're more, we're more stars of stage than screen. Uh, I'm making this video with a live audience of one, so I'll have to draw on that audience. Now, as you watch me on this video, I've just finished a fortnight island hopping through Croatia, and I'm about to embark on attacking my favourite parts of Italy. Sorry about that. There is probably an upside in me not being there live and in person, because being away from you might embolden me a little. I've got some uh, stern messages to deliver today, uh, some of the things I'll say aren't that pretty, um, and some of you mightn't even like what I've got to say. So the fact I won't see you at morning tea or at lunch over a cup of tea just might help me a little bit. Now on the other hand, um, my critics or the people who don't agree with what I've got to say today, they don't have to bump into me either, so they might get away with a few cheap shots. And I don't want that, I want you to keep them honest. I'm going to express some opinions today about the state of governance in Victoria and local government. Now, it's my opinion, and mostly that's all it is. It's opinion. I mean, that's the thing about governance. There's not a lot of hard data or facts we can bring to bear on the argument. But I, I think I probably need to argue that if I'm giving you some opinions, they're drawn from a sound basis. So I spent 30 years as a local government chief executive. Since finishing work, eight years ago, I've consulted to about 50 of you, 50 councils and peak bodies in the state. I think I've had a unique opportunity to see inside a lot of councils and to evaluate what I've seen against my fairly lengthy experience. So if you end up disagreeing with what I've got to say today, well and good. But don't discredit my views because you think they come from either ignorance or disengagement with the sector. I've been working in the sector for 43 years and I've always been someone who's optimistic about the sector. So, in short, I reckon I'm an insider and I'm a patriot. My central propositions for today are simple. I think that many elements of governance in Victoria and local government are a sort of a post-war relic and might be a little bit broken. Well, if they're not broken, they're seriously damaged. When I recently described our, our governance framework as a post-war model, someone asked me, which war? I'm going to express some views today about three principal things. Firstly, councillors. Who are the candidates and how well are we choosing them? Secondly, shared power. How can we clarify the roles and responsibilities in local government between councillors and management? And thirdly, how well do we engage with our citizens? So let's start with the hardest one, councillors, the thorniest issue. Who seeks office and why? How well are we choosing? I live in Essendon. My former neighbour in Essendon, in the street where I live, Margaret, would be a fantastic councillor. Born and bred, tertiary educated, connected in so many community organisations, uh, a, a family life history in the Essendon and District. Her sense of community is particularly strong. She has a very strong interest in what the City of Mooney Valley does. She will not run for council. There are several reasons why Margaret wrote one, and I think they affect hundreds of, if not thousands of people in Victoria. The first reason is she heeds the conventional wisdom. Councillors have to spend 15, 20, 30 hours a week in the role. Margaret cannot make that commitment. Are there many Margarets around? People who would like to be a councillor but can't give it 30 hours a week? I think there's thousands. I think there's thousands of high quality people who can't devote that much time. Would it help if councillor remuneration was much higher? Probably, probably, but in Margaret's case that's not the key issue. She hasn't got the time. For others, it might be the money. This is a very simple idea. 
if councillors could effectively play their role with a much reduced time commitment and be paid properly for the time, would we see a surge in capable, competent, community-connected citizens wanting to be a councillor? I say probably. Probably. Yet time and again this issue has been addressed as a money issue. It's not. It's time and pay. The very large number of hours put in by many Victorian councillors, I think, is based far too much on the notion that councillors have to connect with every citizen. Now, I nearly said connect with every voter, but that would have been cheeky, so I didn't say that. Sorry, that's the bit about governance that we've got to change. In this day of modern communications, of customer request systems, of service planning and customer service charters, we've still got too many councillors who I think masquerade as customer service officers. There's still a feeling around local government, and I think perhaps around communities, that it's better if you know a councillor. Now, when the power goes off at my house, I don't ring a board member of Origin Energy, and when the water main bursts in the street, I don't ring a board member of City West Water. In fact, I thought about it, I can't ever remember in my life ringing a councillor about a problem in my neighbourhood. I've certainly spoke to councillors about issues, policy issues and strategic issues that I'd like to discuss and be involved in the decision. I don't remember reporting a broken street tree or a, or a broken seat street or a hole in the road. For councillors that agree with me that they are not and should not be customer service officers, they might find my next point a bit of a shock. I think it's council organisations that need to connect and engage with citizens, not necessarily councillors. Councillors need broad connections in the community. They need to know what the community thinks, they need to know what the community reckons is important. But engaging with citizens around specific issues and problems should be a fundamental part of local government organisational life. Councillors should take the temperature of the community, the vibe in the community. Community engagement cannot depend on me bumping into a councillor. For me it's clear, I want 10 hours a week from councillors and I double their pay. It's an important, responsible job, we should pay it properly. Do we need as many councillors as we've got? Well, we do if we're going to rely on people bumping into them to influence a decision. But no, that's not the model, and no, we don't. The world has shrunk. The whole world shrunk. Communications these days are so good. You know, we didn't have photocopies until 1975. We didn't have a photocopy. You couldn't reproduce an original document until 1975. Engagement was word of mouth. That won't work now. That cannot work. For me, it's very clear again, we don't need so many councillors. We need to force the issue, make councillors take their corporate governance role, the decision-making role, seriously. Councillors need to ensure that their organisations can engage, communicate and listen to citizens. Councillors should be working on the system, not in the system. You know, we've nearly got as many councillors per council as we did post-war. It's not that much different. I know we've got lots fewer councillors and the council areas are bigger, but how much better connected are we? I think we can do with fewer councillors. We've got enough for what we'd call, I'd call personal coverage. And I think that's a nonsense. We're also currently struggling under a particularly unusual phenomenon. Councillors who during the 2009-2000 term have had their bad behaviours, those councillors who've had their bad behaviours proven and substantiated by panels or VCAT, have been overwhelmingly re-elected last October. There are several notable examples, none better than a Shepparton City Councillor whose first term in discretions made little difference to his popularity and he was promptly re-elected in October and was recently disqualified from office for four years. Clearly, there's a significant proportion of voters who are happy to elect candidates with a track record of bad behaviour and code breaches. It's probably a keep the bastards honest approach. It's fueled by the particularly aggressive, is it fueled by the particularly highly adversarial and aggressive and personality politics which is on view at a national level? Have we normalised bad behaviour? Win at all costs, the ends justifies the means.
Maybe, maybe we have. Is it damaging? I've no doubt whatsoever that it's fundamentally important to Margaret, my neighbour. She and thousands like her will not stand for counsel if she reckons she'll be intimidated, bullied, belittled or personally harassed for her views and her opinions. If we want quality people, we must stop the bad behaviour. Bad behaviour also has a significant impact on the quality of governance at each council. It, its impact can range from high nuisance value to paralysing. Again, I think, and I'm not going to mention examples, but you know the examples. Why do I think this happens? Why can one or two councillors, whose behaviour is regularly on the edge of code requirements, make things so difficult for others? I think the answer lies in the relatively unstructured nature of engagement between councillors and engagement between councillors and officers away from council meetings. Council meetings, we control behaviour. Codes of conduct, meeting procedure, the public and the media watching on. In relative terms, a council meeting is a controlled event and behaviour is well regulated. The rest of the engagements outside council meetings, and I guess I'm talking particularly about councillor assemblies, are a different kettle of fish. Council assemblies have been a regular part of the local government landscape probably since municipal restructuring in the mid-1990s. Councillor briefings became important components of the governance process, providing councillors with opportunities to better understand complex issues in a less formal or structured setting. Councillor briefings have been regulated to a point by legislation several years ago because they'd lost their way. They were being used as mini council meetings, Straw votes were being held, inappropriate directions given to management. Council briefings were contributing to some bad governance. Those problems which beset assemblies have, I think, largely been overcome, probably because we refocused our attention in the latter period on the principles of good governance. However, assemblies largely remain informal and unregulated. They are mostly held in private. As a consultant, I attend many assemblies they are fertile ground for poor conduct. A little later on I want to say some things about the benefits of more clearly mandating some of local government's most important functions and responsibilities between councillors and between management. At this stage I'd like to say I would clearly mandate to council CEO the responsibility for the conduct of councillor assemblies, or, in, or at least those assemblies we refer to as briefings. That's how they begun management briefing councillors about significant issues. In the mid-90s, I was at Maribyrnong as the CEO. In fact, I chaired the councillor briefings at, those, at Maribyrnong. I was responsible for the agenda and the conduct of proceedings. I think we could do well to look at a return to those kind of arrangements. I've recently noticed some surveying of councillors and management being undertaken by local government Victoria on the subject of councillor behaviour. Good. The sector needs to exercise a heavier hand. Current remedies are tedious and all-consuming. We need swifter remedies. I'd now like to talk about how well we're choosing our councillors. Us, the voters. We are very uncertain and quite confused. There are so many candidates. When I read the candidate CVs, there are far too many with almost no civic community or organisational experience. You know, one of the most talented councillors I worked with once said to me that a carefully constructed and funded local government campaign could get Donald Duck elected to a councillor. I think there's enormous disengagement between voters and candidates. There are so many candidates, not all of them intend on winning the ballot. Read the candidate statements. People are getting elected without a skerrick of community activism or civic contribution. Elected on a 150 word short statement. Elected on a good photo. Now, the proliferation of candidates and dummy candidates is occurring partly because political parties seldom endorse council candidates. In fact, political parties are almost invisible at council elections with apologies to the Greens. Candidates with political affiliations keep it quiet. They'd rather tell you they're president of the junior footy club than tell you they're a member of the ALP or the Liberal Party. 
I wish the major political parties would do some of the voters' work for us. I'd like them to pick out their best candidates and endorse them. Now, even from my sunny Rome hotel, I can hear some of you now groaning about party politics impacting into local government. Woe, woe is us. I find the loudest groans about party politics in local government come from councillors and management in councils that don't have any party politics in their council. In other words, if you've worked with it, you don't mind it so much. My last decade plus as a CEO worked with councils who were characterised by party politics on a weekly or daily basis. My experience wasn't one of party dogma or party policy dominating the local agenda. It was quite the contrary. It provided some structure. It provided a bit of discipline. I reckon there are more pluses than minuses when it comes to party endorsements. Fewer candidates, fewer dummy candidates, consistent policy direction, a bit of discipline and structure, a reason to cast a vote, an explanation to cast a vote. I actually think political endorsement might assist behaviour. If a candidate's been endorsed, the party might do something when they start trashing the brand. The only discipline we currently have in the sector is the code of conduct and consequent regulatory activity under the code. Now, how do you reckon conduct panels are working? Has bad councillor behaviour ever been so widespread? It's my view that the unaligned nature of many councillors within their council structure actually perpetuates bad conduct. Unaligned councillors keep tolerating bad behaviour. They keep turning the other cheek. They keep thinking if they appeal to a recalcitrant a recalcitrant councillor's better nature, though the councillor will change. They seek to be inclusive and tolerant and conciliatory, and it never works. I think some political party structures and discipline might be a very good thing. I've had a bit to do with some dysfunctional councils in recent years, brought about by totally disrespectful councillors, and I'm amazed at how forgiving the other councillors are. The best simplest way to deal with recalcitrant minorities of councillors who disrespect good governance principles is to use the numbers. The other electoral phenomenon that has occurred in parallel to what I perceive to be very high levels of voter disengagement is postal voting. Postal voting requires a candidate to construct a sound candidate statement, get some nifty propaganda and a very good photo. Do that and you're in with a serious chance. Attendance voting requires a lot more for success. Supporters, people working at polling booths. I reckon attendance voting ups the ante on us voters. It's too easy to comply with postal voting. If you've got to go to a booth and vote, you give it some thought. It forces you to. You might even discuss your voter ignorance with a partner or a friend. People often go in pairs or families. Does attendance voting make us think a little bit more? The metrics we use to decide that postal voting is superior to attendance voting, that is cost and participation, are the wrong metrics. Certainly it's cheaper, certainly more people fill in a valid vote. If it's so good, that's postal voting, let's have it in state and federal elections. Fat chance. Finally, three other current arrangements which I think are worth reviewing. Compulsory voting. Now, gosh, that's, that's a sacred cow of democracy in Australia. My sense of voter disengagement in local government, particularly in large municipalities, is such that I'm prepared to argue that compulsory voting isn't helping much. I reckon too many votes are cast without a reason or for a strange reason. Now, that's purely anecdotal opinion, I know. But I ask lots of people, do your own tests. Ask the girl on the tram who's 19 years of age how she voted at her suburban local council election last year and what you thought of casting that vote. Ask your neighbours, ask your extended family. The way, we fill ex sorry, the way we fill extraordinary vacancies in office, by offering the job to the runner-up, or worse, to fill the vacancy. Try that at a state or federal level. I'm unconvinced about that approach. The notion is driven by save some money or don't inconvenience the voters. What does it do to achieve a higher level of engagement between council and its citizens? 
Thirdly, I remain unconvinced about the worth of wards. Wards guarantee a spatial distribution of councillors, but they also create parochial fiefdoms. You know, every councillor that's elected to office from a ward or at large takes an oath or an affirmation to vote in the long-term best interests of the citizens of the municipality. How many councillors who've come from a ward basis, from a ward election, have I seen take that oath or affirmation and at their first council meeting vote in the long-term best interests of the members of their ward? So, to summarise so far around councillors, who's running and how we pick them. I think our governance arrangements for local government are outdated. I think we need fewer councillors, paid plenty more, but require less of their time. I'm acutely aware of the arguments you'll run around. It's not a corporation, it's not BHP, it's government. I know all that. We've been, that's been a topic of discussion for my 43 years in local government and probably the 43 years prior to that. I repeat, fewer councillors paid more with committing less time. That's how my neighbour Margaret might run. We must reduce bad behaviours by better mandating responsibilities outside council meetings and have a swift and having swifter, simpler mechanisms to deal with the breaches. We must make some changes to improve voter engagement at council elections. Party political endorsements and attendance voting are worth reconsidering. Let me move on and address some of the changes I want to talk about in the way power is shared in local government between councillors and employees. A little bit of history first. Post-war local government was very managerial. The government style was particularly representative. So the notion was councillors were elected by constituents or citizens and then the councillors felt like they could exercise a vote which they perceived to be in the long-term best interests of the citizens. The role of employees, particularly management, was very significant because councillor participation was almost solely confined to council meetings. Uh, I was a young man in the Western District at a small rural council where I saw the councillors once a month. At 9am on the second Friday they arrived and I was lucky to get them out of the building by 9pm that night. I saw them not in the intervening four weeks. Never. I could honestly say never, in particular in respect to many of the councils, the odd one occasionally. So it, it was a, a high form of representative governance that councillors were undertaking with management filling in the gaps between every second Friday. Participative democracy, that is giving citizens a direct say in local issues, local issues only started probably in the 70s and 80s and blossomed, of course, once we had communications technology, photocopiers, 1975, digital, 1995, uh, over the uh, following 30 or 40 years. The last 10 or 15 years have seen the development of real tensions in communities about where power lies in the shared power arrangements, which are part of local government. We have local government election candidates standing on platforms of diminishing the power of the CEO or the executive management. Popular community opinion is often slanted towards thinking it's council management that's really running the show not the councillors. Many people think the tail wags the dog. Now, truth is, councillors are in charge of almost everything that's important. Councillors take all the big decisions. The council plan, the budget, the capital program, the strategies, the priorities, hiring the CEO. They make all the big decisions. So why do so many communities reckon councils' management is where the real power lies? I think it occurs because we confuse citizens about power and who exercise it. Ponder some of these pretty common scenarios that are happening across our state. Council meetings where council management participate extensively in council meetings, introducing reports, expanding their commentary, answering questions, providing clarifications, sometimes providing cautionary comments about compliance or legal issues. Council meetings where management and councillors sit around a table, sometimes interspersed, not even in a clump. There's at least one council I know in the Melbourne area where the management of the council sit on a podium higher than the councillors. Would that confuse an observer's understanding about where power might lie? Council meetings where CEOs provide rulings on meeting procedure and local laws. CEO, council CEOs appearing on regional TV news programs, explaining council's position on important issues. 
council communication staff issuing press releases where it, which exclusively quote council management. Council meetings where a lengthy, complex, significant report is simply received and adopted by the council without debate. Now all those activities confirm in people's minds a confusion which exists. Where does power really lie? Who is really running the show? When we receive a long, complex, significant report at a council meeting, receive it and adopt it without debate. Who looks clever and who looks silly? The cleverest person is the author, and the people who adopt it and can't debate it are the silly ones. All of these activities are happening somewhere around the state. Many councils are doing better than that, I know that. But as a broad sector, these things are going on. None of them help people to understand where power really lies. All of these activities add to citizen confusion and media confusion. The media is many people's window into the governance framework operating at a council. Your council meetings create the governance vibe in your municipality through media reports. Do your processes educate your media about where power lies and how it is exercised? So I think it's time to change some things that we currently do that confuse people. And I'll start with council meetings. We should do nothing at a council meeting which confuses people about where power lies. Apart from the obvious stuff like the furniture and who sits where, let's try this. No management whatsoever at council meetings. None at all. Some administrative staff to help out, maybe some policy helpers to get the councillors bits and pieces organised, but I think the time's come to an end to end the very confusing role management plays at council meetings, and I think the best way is if they stay away. No more CEOs sitting next to the mayor playing the puppeteer. You can almost see the CEO's hand up the mayor's back. Now, what might be some of the outcomes if we leave it to the councillors? Over time, I think councillors would always pick the best person to be mayor. I think the mayor would be highly skilled chairperson. I think planning and preparation that should be part of any council and every council meeting would be more in evidence. All the questions and answers would have been asked and been given a week or two earlier. We'd get more open, informed, articulate debate. I wish people would remember that the whole purpose of a council briefing around key issues to be addressed in a decision-making framework at a council meeting is to actually enhance the quality of debate at the council meeting. Council meetings are a window into the governance of a, councillor, a council. The media looks through that window and the local newspaper significantly shapes local opinions about your governance. I think it's time to clearly demonstrate that the people who are really in charge are in fact in charge. Council meetings need lots of reform. We don't see on a broad scale right across the sector the kind of governance we should expect, namely big, important, comprehensive issues being debated in a quality way by well-informed and well-prepared councillors. Quality advice underpinned by evidence, analysis, impacts and options from management. Some best practice public participation in council meetings. You know, I was watching a current affairs program last week which was specula speculating about the federal election and someone made mention of the importance of what they called town hall style debates between the leaders of the parliamentary parties. I googled that term, it's an American term. It means grounded, unscripted public participation. Why don't we see those kinds of things happening in our town halls much anymore? It's been talked about town hall meetings and that's a federal concept. Um, too many of us have 30 minute public question time. And then you might have to give 48 hours or one week's notice in writing of what your question might be. No comments or statements. I've heard many a mayor say, what's the question? No comments or statements. Now, in my view, council meetings need some fundamental ingredients if they are to be regarded as good governance. The issues discussed should be important. Find some alternative pathways for unimportant issues. You know, most councils meet for about 40 hours a year and in council meeting format. There's not enough time to talk about unimportant things. Every issue needs debate. All the communities I've lived in and worked in want diverse views and strong opinions expressed at the council table. So please get organised and debate the issues skillfully. 
Citizen views about important issues are worth hearing, so facilitate it. Several Victorians are doing, Victorian councils are doing a great job in this regard. That principle doesn't mean we need to hear every neighbour's dispute discussing self-interest over a planning permit. What I, when I say important issues, I mean important to the whole community. Now, it's a bit risky to talk about regulatory reform, but I reckon we need some. It's in the area of this blurred responsibilities, this shared power. I speak to lots of people in local government about the, responsible, the responsibilities and roles of councillors and employees. I often hear people talking about some matter which they describe as operational, and therefore the responsibility for that lies with the CEO, not the council. Now let's be clear, legislation says the CEO is responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the organisation, whatever that means. It doesn't mean that councillors have no legitimate interest in the quality of a council's work. They have a legitimate interest in the quality of the work provided by the council's bureaucracy. See, my beef is that the Local Government Act doesn't mandate activities or responsibilities between council and management. It's left us with this blurred area. And then we've tried to make some certainty out of this blurred area by inventing a few things. That's operational, it's the CEO. That's strategic, it's the council. If you can find that anywhere in the Local Government Act, I'd be particularly interested. Pitch a question at Mark Hayes when you see him at this conference and ask Mark whether such clarity exists. Let's take, for example, local government regulation requiring councils to undertake best value. Best value is a kind of service planning, continuous improvement process designed to achieve cost and quality standards. It's important work. Of, council's 79, of Victoria's 79 councils, how many take it seriously? Every service a council delivers is required to be best valued at least once every five years. My feeling is that a majority of Victorian councils provide lip service to best value. I wonder why. The law says the council shall undertake best value. Now we know who the council is. The council are the councillors in council, sitting at a council meeting. If the law mandated the Chief Executive Officer with the responsibility to prepare service plans with cost and service quality options accompanied by a continuous improvement plan and, and the law required the CA to submit those options and plans to the Council for adoption and endorsement, I reckon the job would get done. I mean, one of the sensible changes we made 20 years ago was to clearly mandate to the Chief Executive Officer the responsibility for employees, hire, fire, recruitment, industrial relations, etc. That's largely worked well. It's provided the right kinds of checks and balances in our employment function. Clarity has brought better outcomes. I think some more clarity might bring some more better outcomes. So to summarise the second session, we need to conduct our affairs like council meetings to clarify, not confuse citizens and media where power actually lies. We should specifically mandate to management some of the important responsibilities that are often neglected because responsibility is shared or worse, blurred. Okay, finally, I want to talk about how well we connect and engage with our citizens. There are a lot of dimensions to the subject of citizen engagement and we need a conference for a couple of days just to talk about that. But I want to concern myself with three uh, of the dimensions to this issue. Technology, relationships with customers and technique. Firstly, technology. When I previously mentioned how our post-war capability was to broadly engage with our citizens was often very limited through lack of technology. Uh, get your head around how difficult it would be to consult about um, a proposed new playground with the people who live near the playground if you couldn't make a photocopy of the design of the playground. There's only an original and you couldn't photocopy it. It'd be pretty hard. We can no longer say that. Technology takes us anywhere these days. But as a sector, our application of technology to help us engage with our citizens has been fairly slow. Across the sector, I think there are still too few councils systematically collecting your email and mobile telephone contact numbers. You know, every quarter the Deputy Commissioner of Taxation sends me a text message reminding me my BAS statement is due. 
Uh, when I drive my car in country Victoria on a hot day, the emergency services commissioner tells me to watch out for fires and be careful. So when it's my taxes or my life, people can send me a text. Uh, when we want to remind dog owners to register the dog next week, we're more than likely to put an ad on page 60 of the classifieds in the local paper than send all the dog owners a reminder. Now, I know some of you are sending text messages to dog owners to remind them about registration, and that's good. I know many of you in specific council businesses, childcare, for example, are using text to stay in contact with parents and children and pickups and all the rest of it, and that's good. But the reality is that a typical council in Victoria still has some PC-based databases, probably 100 of them or 50 of them, right across their organisation, not connected with each other and not talking to each other. There's a disconnection in the way we engage with our citizens based on such clumsy technology. The truth is, my wine store communicates better with me than my council. The second issue I want to raise is relationships with customers. Quality engagement normally arises from a good relationship. So what we need first is a relationship, then we might get quality engagement. Think about your personal life. Do we build relationships with citizens when we don't actually want anything specific from them? Or are we inclined to want to deal with them when we need to know something from them? Do they object? Do they consent? What do they think? Etc. Etc. What time do we spend actually just building a relationship with our citizens? For example, I recently purchased a green bin, a green waste bin from my council. Now, there's a hint here. When I bought that bin, there's a hint to the council that I'm maybe a little bit green and a bit interested in not putting the green waste into my uh, rubbish bin to go to the tip to generate carbon, etc., etc. They, know, they get my name and address, they didn't get my email address, they didn't get asked for my phone number, but I never received a brochure from them talking to me about green issues. There's a hint, I could be a bit green, I'm, t I'm paying an extra 60 bucks a year to make sure my green waste doesn't go to the tip. When I bought my compost bin off the council, there's another hint, I want to compost, I want to make compost. I wish they'd sent me a brochure telling me how to make compost. I thought my wife knew how to make the compost. She thought I knew how to make the compost. We're making very bad compost, but we're having a go. You know, there's a hint in these transactions. Even when I register my dog, I might be a dog lover. Uh, I might be interested in responsible pet care. But we don't sort of set up a relationship over my interests, my green interests, my dog interests. I'm giving the council enough hints. They're not really responding to me with some information on, on which we might build a non-adversarial, non-specific issue relationship. Finally, technique, our technique. I think we've become masters of spin and I don't see a place for spin, well I don't see a place for spin in any government, I certainly don't see it in local government. I don't mind if when Exxon drop an oil tanker load of oil in the Mexican Gulf if a bloke wants to go on and spin his way out of it and talk about there won't be many marine creatures affected and the, the oil won't spill far, that's okay, they can spin all they like. That's not our job. We don't do that. When we engage with our citizens in a, in a, a strategic communications technique, in a technique, I think there's four reasons we can talk to them. One's accountability. We said we'd do this and we're doing this. We're keeping our promise or we're not. The second is leadership. This has come up and this is what we propose. The third is access and inclusion. Um, we're offering this service, you too may benefit, you too can join in. And the final one is participation. What do you think? We think this, but what do you think? If we're not talking about one of those four things when we strategically engage with citizens, I'm not sure we should be talking to them. You know, I had an unusual experience with my council over the last 12 months where I started to feel a acutely aware of this spin uh, component. Um, two small things, they're all public knowledge, so I've got insider uh, knowledge about Mitty Valley Council. The first was when uh, both our former mayor and former two former mayors had to go to court in relation to some charges uh, associated with a, a long issue around uh, uh, the operation of the CEO Performance Appraisal Committee and a pay rise. Now, 
The issue was much more about some untidy governance paperwork than anything else, but the magistrate was pretty, uh, pretty strong in his comments about that this matter would be um, of great concern to the citizens of Mooney Valley, involving moderate sums of money not handled in exactly the right way. While those court cases were going up, I had to drive past um, a large mound on Mount Alexander Road every day that had been built, built up, a mound of earth, planted in flowers, and the flowers could be used to make shapes or words. And the council decided the words they were put on the mound were world class locally. World class locally. And I thought, well, that's not what the magistrate said. That's not what he said. And then I, I received my quarterly council magazine, 25 pages of great information about my council and what they're doing. Did we mention what the magistrate said in the magazine? Did, was the elephant in the room talked about? Of course it wasn't. We were spinning some other stuff. I then received a little later a brochure. And the brochure was pre-election, just before the, uh, naturally, just before the uh, election period. A little brochure which set out the main commitments the council had established for itself four years earlier and a report card on how they'd gone, you see. And, of course, the report card used the cross and tick technique. And there were 23 main commitments that had been made. And I wonder how many ticks there were and how many crosses there were. Are you surprised to know there were 23 ticks? There wasn't a cross. I'm not sure who dreamt that up. You see, if I dreamt that up, I'd have put in at least one or two crosses to make the other 20-odd ticks look more likely and realistic. Yeah. I think it's spin. What's that? To, it's a bit to do with accountability. I'm not sure a tick and cross system cuts it. So we don't need spin. We shouldn't have spin. We need to avoid spin. We've fallen into a trap of spin and not being sincere about some of the technique in our communications. To summarise this bit, I guess we need to apply technology more rapidly because our citizens are. We need to build relationships with our citizens and our customers and then we might have a quality engagement. Relationship first. And the third thing is let's cut out the spin. Folks, that's all from me today. Um, I hope the sector understands how important good governance is. I hope we're ready to make some important changes to our governance framework. Enjoy the conference.